As China celebrates the Year of the Dragon, it's another emblematic sign of the Chinese zodiac that most concerns Li Chuan. I was born in the Year of the Tiger, and I had affinity with the tiger. But I actually didn't realize the South China tiger was the most endangered tiger in the world. Until recently, Li Chuan was a high-flying fashion executive at Gucci. This petite, stylish Chinese lady seems an unlikely champion of conservation. You're a walking advert for the tigers. You've got round your neck a lovely little tiger necklace and your sunglasses had tiger motifs and you've got a leopard top and yesterday you had some wonderful high-heeled shoes which were leopard as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a parallel between my fashion career and what I do now is really all creating beauty or preserving beauty. Ten years ago, Li Chuan turned her back on the designer fashion world and found a new purpose in life. Using their own funds, she and her investment banker husband, Stuart Bray, launched a highly ambitious and controversial programme to save the critically endangered South China tiger from extinction. I absolutely had no idea what conservation was about until I actually went to Zambia. And for the first time, I realised conservation of a species is really habitat conservation. You have to link the two together. Without their natural habitat, there is no way you can save animal. You can keep a tiger in the zoo and breed them, but they would be considered functionally extinct if they're not found in the wild. When Lee started her project, no South China tigers had been seen in the wild for years, and there were only around 60 of these emblematic animals left in zoos. Lee embarked on a highly ambitious plan to take these captive animals back to a wild environment and teach them to survive independently. Initially, she wanted to bring African conservation expertise to China to help with her programme. But with no formal conservation experience, she found herself cold-shouldered by the big cat experts. Having failed to enlist supports from the big conservation organisations around the world, and I was not able to bring any expertise to China to help rewild the tigers in China, I thought then I should bring the tigers out here to South Africa. It was an audacious idea. Arguing that time was running out fast, Li persuaded the Chinese authorities to lend her two of their precious zoo-bred tigers to be flown to South Africa where they could learn to hunt and breed in the wild. Eventually, cubs born to be wild could be taken back to China to specially created wilderness reserves. The Chinese government initially was a little bit scared and they, you know, they said, well, there's so few South China tigers left. We really can't afford to bring more outside of China. It's almost impossible. But I actually persuaded them that this is going to be very beneficial for China because through bringing the South China tiger outside of China, we will have expedited rewilding program. And then in the meantime, we can get the expertise from South Africa to China to help China identify possible sites and restore habitat and to prepare for the tiger's return. The first tigers that came here were Cathay and Hope. Both were born in Shanghai Zoo and they were respectively seven and eight months old. They arrived in South Africa on 2nd of September 2003. A year later, two more cubs, Madonna and Tiger Woods, joined Hope and Cathay in South Africa. The first two batches of tigers were young cubs because what we want to do is to start from young tigers during their learning stage and then providing them with the environment and let them regain their hunting instinct. Nothing like this has ever been tried before. And the big question is, can it save one of the world's most endangered species? Apart from the risky logistics and sheer daring of air freighting such rare creatures halfway round the world, many conservation experts viewed Lee's efforts as misguided, without the slightest hope of success. When Lee started, there was a backlash among wildlife biologists. Why are these tigers going to South Africa? Why can't they do this in China? There's a number of concerns that people had about the project when it was first initiated, not least that by moving animals to South Africa doesn't actually address the main cause of the problem of decline in the first place, which is that the habitat is not available where the animals actually come from. 
We'll be hearing more of some of these arguments later in the programme. But Lee maintains that the land and expertise were simply not available in China and the conservation clock was ticking too loudly for the tigers to wait for local conditions to improve. If we can provide the tigers with any large space, it doesn't matter where, because the tigers are known to be super adaptable. They range from the uh, tropical land of Sumatra and Java to cold, snowy Siberia. And they range from eastern of China to the desert of Iran and Turkey. So they're highly adaptable. The only thing they need is cover and food. South Africa has top-class skills and long experience in wildlife management. But even here, there was virtually no experience of taking captive-bred animals back to the wild. I'm Matty van Eck and I am mommy to all the animals. Behind us we've got, I presume those are parrots, are they? Noisy parrots, yes. This is Laurie Park, a wildlife rescue centre just outside Johannesburg, full of lions and exotic birds. And for the last few months, it's been home to a precious South China tiger cub. Come, Lenky. What a lovely face that is, isn't it? Just. <laughs> now three months old, Miss X is playfully bouncing around on powerful paws the size of dinner plates. She's very interested in what's going on here in our microphone and things and making lovely little noises. She's a typical South China tiger. Her nose is very long. The skull is very narrow, her ears are kind of long, and, and she has also long legs and very slender body. And that's all hallmark of South China tiger. This priceless cub is Cathay's offspring, one of the first generation to be born in South Africa. She's been hand-reared here at Laurie Park for the first few months of her life because of concerns for her survival. X is very precious because we lost her sibling from last litter and her uh, last sibling from a year ago was taken by a bird of prey. A bird of prey? Yes. Goodness. Yeah. She was born in natural conditions and uh, we can only guess, and probably ego or something like that. Yeah. It's early morning and the day has come when Miss X is to be returned to the Karoo Reserve where she was born and where she's going to be taught to hunt for herself and live as a wild tiger. I really, really respect this whole project because when Lee started it, everybody said she was mad, that you could not rewild a hand-reared animal. And she's proved it, and those animals are such awesome hunters. It's unbelievable. And they all come from concrete zoos. Once Matty and Lee have loaded Miss X into the back of the truck, we set off on the day-long drive to take her back to the reserve. So, Matty, we're on our way now. We've just stopped at this filling station. Why have we stopped here? Well, we've stopped because, um, first of all, we all need a coffee and mainly to feed Miss Act. It's time for her to eat. Is, is she OK, do you think, or is, is she a little disturbed by the journey? I think she's fine. She deals very well. <laughs> well she's really enjoying that, isn't she? <laughs> when you fill up with petrol, what do the guys say? Do they, any of them look in the back and get startled? Well, nobody really gets to see her because, we, you know, when you're travelling with an animal, it's best to keep them covered. They feel more secure and they feel safe. Gives a whole new meaning to the slogan, put a tiger in your tank. <laughs> Absolutely, it does too. <laughs> Lee and her husband, Stuart, have bought 33,000 hectares of land for the rewilding programme. It's in the Karoo, a huge area of dry grassland in the centre of South Africa, and it's dissected by the mighty Orange River. We've just arrived at the reserve and they've just opened the gates into the reserve, which seems to be in the middle of nowhere. Welcome to Local Valley Reserve. It's beautiful, you see. It's just beautiful. And it's restored from 17 defunct sheep farms. Lao Hu Valley means Valley of the Tigers in Chinese. It's an area of low hills dotted with bushes and interspersed with wide valleys of golden grass. This time of the year it's very dry and it seems to catch the sunlight. Huge sky, very peaceful. We toured down the fences between all the sheep farms. We put up perimeter fence around it and basically we formed a new wildlife reserve 
were introduced the indigenous games, all kind of antelope like elands, kudus, uh, springbok, and um, started basically letting the land recover. It took about five years to actually return to current condition. This is now the South China Tiger's home. At the moment, they're confined to 200 hectares in the centre of the reserve, where there are a number of different sized enclosures for different stages of the rewilding programme. The other tigers pace the fence and watch curiously as Miss X is unloaded from the truck into the small enclosure that will be her temporary home. She's an incredible traveller. <laughs> She's just been so calm and uh, I'm very pleased. It's gone very smoothly. This is your home. You were born here. She's become very excited and a bit bewildered, going around sniffing everything. She's chuffing at you, hey. <laughs> chuffing mm. is like a tiger's greeting sound. <laughs> X, come. Huwa. That's your new name, hey, Huwa. Now that the cub has arrived at the reserve, she will be known by this new name, which was chosen by a public competition in China. The new name means the Hu is a tiger. Why is also the name of the female ancestor who begets the Chinese nation. Hu Wa will spend two weeks here, while Li and her team slowly reintroduce her to her mother in the next enclosure. It's a little bit controversial because people believe that big cats cannot be put together with smaller, they will kill them. But I had experience putting several times big cats with other little tigers, and uh, she's got incredible maternal instinct. So I hope this time she will be the same. This is uncharted territory, and Lee and her team are having to learn as they go along. We're going to feed Hua now. Her first night to feed at Lahu Valley Reserve. Dinner is meat and a bottle of milk, and the journey doesn't seem to have affected who was appetite. Oh, she's taking that one, isn't she? Yes. Because she is going to learn to be wild, we have to win her off the bottle. So she's only had a small bit in the bottle this time? Yes, exactly. The more you pull, the more she's going to bite. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> she jumped at my microphone and pulled it out of the machine. Soon we have to stop the interaction between humans and her, otherwise she will never be able to learn to hunt. But still, once they are hunt reared by humans, they can never be completely wild. That's Miss X crying because suddenly all of us have left her and she's not used to being entirely on her own. This little creature has got to get used to being with other tigers rather than humans. Who was introduction to life in the wild is only just beginning. But the first generation of tigers that came to Lauhu are already efficient predators. Tiger Woods is here. We've come down to the central area where there's a series of enclosures all around with different tigers in each one. They're very territorial animals, so you can't put them all in together. This one is Madonna, and she and Tiger Woods came here in November 2004. And they were the second batch of tigers that we took from Chinese zoos to South Africa for rewilding. The task of getting them to breed successfully and hunt their own food in the wild should not be underestimated. When the first generations of tigers arrived from China, Madonna was like a virgin and Tiger Woods was decidedly under par. They have never seen grass before, never seen dirt before. They grew up in concrete cages. So they wouldn't come off the uh, small concrete space at the gate of their camp. And in the zoo, the tigers were fed only chopped up food, so they'd never learnt to hunt for themselves. We um, tried first with feathered chicken carcasses, and they found it very funny, you know, the feathers sort of blowing in the wind, but they wouldn't eat it. They smelled a little bit, and they just left it there. So eventually what we did was we mixed up the chicken meat with the lamb and the beef, and they start liking the uh, the bones, the crunching of the bones, and they start picking out the uh, pieces with the bones, 
and they just slowly progress to eating whole chicken, and eventually linking what they eat with what they catch. They actually didn't know in the very beginning that the funny thing that runs that they chase. Were actually their prey. That's an amazing thing. If you say that at first they didn't like to have the soil under their feet and the grass and so on, and first they were a bit freaked by feathers. How did you move from getting them introduced to a proper carcass to actually being out in the wild? And how far have they progressed? Our goal is for them to regain the abilities to hunt and survive on their own, which they normally learn from the mother. So what? Our project has been doing is really to simulate a wild environment, and then slowly we graduate them to larger prey, to actually return the tigers from captivity to complete wild. It's going to take several generations. There's nowhere else in the world where this process has been done, where you take captive, tame, domestic tigers and, and turn them into wild animals. Mike Bolzer heads the tiger program for WWF, and like many experts in the field. He was initially very sceptical that the project had the slightest prospect of success. The project that they're trying to do in South Africa is right on the edge of technical conservation work. So to have people that you know don't have that background to setting it up, it is sort of something that would put the fear into most of the conservation world. I was shocked to find that、uh, I got no support from the conservation organisations, and not only that, I was actually. Criticized and then later on attacked personally, you know, on my character. From the outset, this program was criticised because people saw holes in it. Dr. Paul Thunston is a big cat specialist at the University of Pretoria. When you have the sort of slightly maverick approaches, those people are not rebuffed because society or that particular society involved in conservation doesn't like them or doesn't agree with them. It's because people can clearly see. That this is not necessarily of tremendous value. I have a lot of responsibilities. You know, the whole conservation world is looking at us. I had always expected that the conservation people should be bunding together and supporting each other in whatever effort. I never realized that、um, there's so much、um, politics going on. And there have been other challenges, including a very acrimonious, long-running court case. Against their original South African conservation partners, over alleged misappropriation of funds meant for the South China Tigers, and there have been other legal disputes too. One day, we suddenly got the police at our door to investigate us for animal abuse, and the local animal welfare organisation, NSPCA, had been looking for opportunity to actually bring us to be prosecuted. So as soon as picture. Of our tigers being shown in the newspaper, was a tiger catching a live game.、Uh, the police came to tell us that we violated the law. Their objection was that you were putting a、um, wild buck into an enclosure specifically as a prey item. Yeah, there is a law that actually says you cannot purposely put animal in a situation that would endanger the wildlife. However, our legal advice basically. Said that、uh, if you really apply that law, everybody would have failed. For example, when you translocate lions to Kruger National Park, the game is going to be endangered. And they're they're going to risk being eaten, and、uh, that took us three years to fight. We went all the way to the Supreme Court. It cost a huge amount of money to do it. You know, we don't really want any trouble, and we also don't want to waste valuable funding on fighting legal wars. So far, most of the funding come from our private savings and also public donations. And so far, we have spent over twenty million dollars on this project. Well, the majority is our own money. I've put substantially everything into the project, and I don't expect to see a return. Lee Chuan's American husband, Stuart Bray, is a former investment banker. It was very much my intention to stay out of it in the beginning. I saw it as a black hole with very poor prospects for success, and told Lee so. And I told her it was my intention not to get involved. And I gave her a bit of seed capital and told her that she must make do with that. 
However, over time, I was gradually intrigued by the project. I saw progress that she was making, how she was pulling various pieces together, and I began to see how it could work. The breakthrough came in November 2007, when the first baby was born. It was the first ever cub born outside of China, and now he's three and a half years age now, and he's a healthy tiger, and he's ready to mate. There are now 14 tigers at Laohu, six of them born in the last year alone. But there have also been major setbacks along the way. Hope unfortunately died from uh, pneumonia and heart failure. So Cathy is the one survived from the first batch of tigers that came here. However, before Hope died, both tigers managed to gain their ability to hunt. Hope's death was a blow. It seemed to undermine the prospects of success for this unconventional project. Concerns have also been raised about the dangers of inbreeding from a handful of rare tigers who themselves might have been inbred in the zoos they came from. Huwa, the cub formerly known as Miss X, was fathered by a tiger called 327, who'd come from China to join the original gang of four. He has some problem because he's got a one testicle, so... Some people think he can't breed, but he bred twice. <laughs> so all of these things, you, you don't even know yet what a really fit tiger is because they've all had this little problem and that little problem. You don't know. We know all the second generations right now, they're extremely fit. The tiger is much healthier here in an open air, large area than in a small enclosed cage. Thirteen cubs have been born in South Africa altogether, of which two have died. By contrast, nine out of ten cubs born in Chinese zoos are said to die. When you go to town and you tell your friends and say that you're working with tigers in South Africa, what do they say? What? Tigers in South Africa? Got to be kidding. Tigers in Africa. Vivian McKenzie has worked at Laohu for almost four years. She monitors the tigers' activity and keeps a detailed log of their behaviour. Yeah, we've got general behaviours, whether or not they're chuffing at people or at other tigers, defecation or urination, to make sure that everything is still functioning as it should. The f information written on the form gets then put into a database. And are they very real characters? Definite personalities, characteristics, the way they walk, the way they hold their heads and uh, the amount of noise they make. Madonna's vocalising at the moment, which she does very often. Do you find that big cat scientists are asking you for these data? Is it quite important to have this stuff for them? It is important, or shall I say it has become important. It's gained scientific importance. And I think we will be seeing in the future a lot more people perhaps adapting their methods to ours. I'm uh, Elena Goot. I come from uh, the Netherlands. I'm doing uh, student research here trying to monitor the, the cyclicity of the female tigers. We are also collecting fecal samples, and those will be analysed for hormones to see in what phase of their cycle they are. With this research, we want to see if we can use this method to monitor their cyclicity, uh, which can be of, of value with regards to the breeding project. In the wild, animals behave differently from captivity. So a lot of the knowledge in the past on tigers because they're so difficult to observe. A lot of the past knowledge were actually learned from observing zoo animals. So now I think we have a unique opportunity to observe tigers in a natural environment. So we're learning new things. And that's why this project is just so unique. And that's why now we're getting more and more scientific recognition and more and more supports from the scientific community. Harriet David Moster is the head of science and research at the Endangered Wildlife Trust in South Africa. I think that when a population gets so close to the brink as these South China tiger or the subspecies of tiger has, has got, then whether it's worth spending huge amounts of money to save the subspecies or rather to focus on the species as a whole is, a, is, is quite an important question. Sometimes I think conservationists and, and scientists tend to get bogged down in, in trying to save little clusters or, or groupings of animals when actually the niche of the tiger in its natural environment is really what we're trying to preserve. So the loss of a little genetic diversity because one subspecies has gone extinct 
might not be as important as trying to make sure that tigers, as a top-order predator, are conserved. Despite millions gone into India, into Siberia, tiger conservation has failed. Now a lot of the people criticized us. You know, I knew they were wrong, and I just、um, decided to get on with our work. And that work has brought results. The original gang of four is now fourteen, and most of them are hunting for themselves. But people like Harriet still have reservations. It's all very well to have animals that can hunt for themselves and can learn the necessary tools to be wild. But if you have nowhere to put them when they're wild, then we've got a major problem. I think there were also a lot of concerns around the type of habitat they would be learning these new skills in. South Africa is considerably different from China. In terms of habitat, and also even the prey, there were concerns that learning to hunt one type of prey might not really equip the tigers for hunting prey back in China. Tigers are pretty flexible animals. My opinion is, if they can kill blessbuck, they'll have no trouble killing sambar and other deer back in China. David Smith is an American tiger biologist who was initially also skeptical about the project in South Africa. Gradually, I visited with Lee and got a very different perspective. And part of the difference in that perspective was, in the past ten years, tigers have gone extinct from population after population all over the world. So now, tiger biologists are beginning to really look seriously at rewilding tigers, not just the South China tiger, but in many localities. And I think in the near future, there's a real need for. The skills that Lee has developed in rewilding tigers. What I think is the challenge now is to find some place to put them. Finding the commitment and land base in China to reestablish these tigers. If they had that, these tigers are ready to go back right now. And in next week's program, we'll be looking at the prospects for the tigers' successful return to China. But for now, despite all the criticisms and challenges she's faced over the last ten years. Li Chuan remains a passionate and determined advocate of this critically endangered species. I really believe it's impossible to get everybody to ever agree on anything completely. So you just have to continue to do what you believe in. If you don't, then you will never get anything done anyway. The good thing is I don't have a PhD. I don't endeavor to have a PhD, so I'm not bothered if they criticize me. <laughs> you know, I think it's, so. There's nothing they can do to stop me. <laughs> I was born in the year of the tiger, and I had affinity with the tiger. Just certain beauty and gracefulness about this perfect predator. <laughs> But I actually didn't realize the South China tiger was actually the most endangered tiger in the world. Ten years ago, Li Chuan, a petite former fashion executive at Gucci, and her American multi-millionaire banker husband, turned their backs on the corporate world and decided to use their personal wealth for a last-ditch attempt to save the South China tiger from extinction.、Aww. Today, these beautiful creatures are under tremendous pressure. The South China tiger hasn't been seen in the wild for many years, and there are fewer than 60 left in Chinese zoos. There were 40,000 tigers in China in 1900. In 50 years, they were reduced to 4,000 in 1950. Humans started moving into even the deep areas with deep mountains, and、uh, basically. Wiped out a lot of the prey species. They're gone. Arguing that time for the Chinese tigers was running out fast, Li persuaded the Chinese authorities to lend her two precious zoo-bred tigers to be flown to South Africa, where they could learn to hunt and breed again. The first two tigers to arrive in 2003 were Hope and Cathay. And the following year, they were joined by Madonna and Tiger Woods. Today, their home is here at Lahu Reserve, a huge tract of overgrazed grassland in the South African Karoo, that Lee and her husband bought and restored. Their ambitious aims are to teach the tigers to survive in the wild and to establish a breeding program. Ultimately, their offspring would be sent back to specially created wildlife reserves in China. Nothing like this had ever been tried before. You know what we have learned here 
at Lahu Valley Reserve is really a combination of the local wildlife management expertise and the experiment of bringing a、uh, captive predator, a zoo-born predator, back to the wild. These animals are irreplaceable. You cannot replace them. If anything happens, it's gone forever. Joseph van Heerden is a vet who's come to Lahu today to sedate two of the tigers. Then wildlife consultant Petri Fulian will fit GPS collars so that their movements can be monitored in the wild. How easy is it to know what sort of dose to give? Well, one needs to look at the and estimate the weight of the animal. That is the difficult part. Coco and Jenby are second-generation tigers born here in South Africa. Now almost four years old, they can successfully catch their own prey. But when their parents arrived from Shanghai Zoo, they'd never had grass under their feet and had no idea how to hunt. <coughs> the first tiger has just been darted. He's dashed off into the centre of the enclosure. Peter, you've taken the time, eh? Okay, good. Now they're just waiting to see where the, the yeah, sedative will take effect. This is a perfect shot here. <laughs> It's now four and a half minutes. Does he look as though he's slowing down a bit? Yes, has shown some responses, but it is a s- slower than my expected reaction. You know, we work with very valuable animals. We can rather underdose than overdose. <laughs> yeah. Lee, are they both down now? The、um, drugs are not enough to、uh, knock the,、uh, them down because the weight. Probably is much more than we would expect it. Okay, so he'll go in and give a little bit more, will he? Exactly, yes. And how are you feeling now? Is this a nervous operation for you? I'm always nervous whenever they need to be darted. Tigers don't react to drugs as well as、uh, lions. There could be accident, and that's why、uh, you have to be very, very cautious. This project has given scientists a unique opportunity to observe and learn about the behaviour of tigers in a managed wild environment. They're taking the vehicle into the enclosure now, with all the equipment for the collaring and for taking measurements. They put a sling over a branch of a tree, and they're hanging the weighing machine from it, wrapping the tiger in a green tarpaulin, and they're going to weigh it. Sartan tiger, a male, weighs between 150 and 185, so could be. Yeah, these are big beasts. They're big beasts and they're in excellent condition. There are now 14 tigers at Lauhu, six of them born in the last year alone. The second generation of South China tigers born in South Africa are now proficient hunters, and ready to be sent back as soon as the Chinese government decides where to put them. The next stage of the project is to set up a reserve in China where these cubs can be reintroduced. The tigers will go through. Two stages. One is really the transition stage, moving from a、uh, large enclosed area here in South Africa back to a large enclosed area in China to be monitored for their readoption process. And once that proves to be successful, then we're going to move the subsequent tigers into large nature reserves. Exactly where these reserves will be has yet to be decided by the Chinese government. In such a densely populated country, the tiger's original habitat has long since been overrun by human settlement. This was one of several reasons for bringing the critically endangered species to South Africa, for the first stage of what has proved to be a very controversial project. A large part of the discussion and debate around this project was about bringing animals from a completely different habitat, rewilding them in South Africa, and then sending them back. When there really wasn't any evidence that there would be enough habitat to support viable populations, or that the original threats that were there for, for tigers in the first place had been adequately addressed, Harriet Davis Mostert is the head of science and research at the Endangered Wildlife Trust in South Africa. Her colleague Kelly Marnewick manages the Carnivore Conservation Program for the trust, and she too has concerns. It's not just about putting a group of animals into one reserve, and. And then it's over and done with. That's really where the big work starts, because now you need to start intensive management around managing the genes and managing the populations and managing the prey base. The threat to most large carnivores isn't that they can't breed or they can't reproduce. The threat is the lack of natural habitat. The range of one tiger in the wild can be anything from 20 to 200 square kilometers, depending on prey density. 
so large tracts of land need to be made available in China for the tiger's return. But Li Chuan says this is a challenge she's been aware of from the outset. I have also been working on China's side as well, and、uh, with the Chinese government, I brought several groups of experts to select the、uh, first couple of sites, doing the ecological survey of the candidate sites. David Smith is an American wildlife biologist who's been working with Lee to select suitable sites. This is a real challenge Lee has. It's a challenge that really has to be met by the Chinese government. They have to make a commitment to a large enough area, and then they have to restore the prey population. And Lee's working very hard to encourage them to think at a bigger scale than they have in the past. Several proposed sites have been identified in four different provinces. Wildlife consultant Petrie Fillion has visited some of them. Some of these sites have certainly got immense potential. There, of course, would still be a huge amount of work one needs to do. In what sort of way? Doing what? Well, firstly, these areas got to be game-proof fenced because ultimately they got to keep the tigers in because these areas are surrounded by human settlements. And secondly, prey populations have to be established. To support the tigers, and those will have to be re-established from captive populations as well. But we believe that that process will be rapid, and as soon as the tigers are ready to be released, and the reserve, of course, is ready with adequate numbers of prey, they will be free released. The tigers will be collared, however, with satellite collars. That is the plan, so that their movements would be followed very closely. That's it. Here in South Africa. Coco and Jenby now have their collars in place. The tigers are gradually coming round the vet in the enclosure, but he's approaching them very gingerly with a long stick, just to check that they're okay as they're waking up. They've got their collars on now. Well, these collars include a combination of VHF capability, so it can be tracked with a directional antenna and line of sight. But over and above that, the collars are also equipped with GPS and movement or activity sensors. This will be of particular importance once the tigers go back to China, where direct observations will be very hard to get because of the environment, more mountainous areas, and of course dense vegetation. We're prepared to restore hundreds of kilometers, and it's going to be a very expensive exercise. There are a lot of people still living in these areas, even though we tried to select areas that didn't have as many people. But still, you know, China is a very populous country, with the exception possibly one of the candidate sites. There are still people, so the local government and central government will have to move those people out of the reserves. Only then can we introduce the Sartana tigers back. The final decision now rests with the Chinese authorities, and David Smith doesn't believe the problem of human settlement is insurmountable. A lots of the places they want to reintroduce tigers, people have left the land and they've gone into urban centers, and yet when you start talking about setting up a reserve, people say, "Well, people still own that land, and if we try to buy it back, it'll be very expensive." China has the money, and so the real question is: Do they have the will to invest to get the land base they need? The tiger's return has already been delayed several times. Li was originally hoping the first ones would be home in time for the 2008 Beijing Olympics in the year of the tiger, but it didn't happen, and these delays have been pounced upon by the project's critics, such as Dr. Paul Funston at the University of Pretoria. If the habitat is gone, if the ability to protect the tigers in the South China area where they occur is no longer feasible, what are we hanging on to? We hang on to emotions, passion, and sentiment. We're not necessarily hanging on to good conservation practice. You know, sometimes one has got to accept the fact that the environment, the way that we've changed the world, just makes it no longer suitable to have tigers there. That does not mean we shouldn't have tigers somewhere. But it means we have to stand back, look at the map, think very carefully about our strategies, and we have to say, well, isn't perhaps better to put our tiger conservation eggs in that area as opposed to here, in an area in which they've got a much greater probability of long-term survival. But Li herself recognizes that even if suitable sites can be found soon in China, there are still enormous challenges ahead. China actually has spent a lot of money 
on wildlife conservation. The trouble is, despite the、um, investment by the government, by the time the funding trickles down to the reserve level, there was very little money left to keep good rangers and good wardens. And because the nature reserves are relatively remote, it's very very difficult for conservation workers to actually patrol every area. So there's a lot of、uh, poaching of prey animals, animals that are actually essential for the existence of large predators. The threat of poaching is something that any introduction program is going to have to take very seriously. Tiger wine made from blood is still highly prized, for instance. Pauline Fachai. Monitors the tiger trade for traffic and WWF. Like other types of illegal trade, such as drugs or weapons, it's very difficult to, to really know what's actually going on. But we do know that trade is happening, and it's a big problem. It's really driving tigers to extinction. And we also know that China is one of the main consumer markets in Asia. A lot of people are becoming wealthy in China right now, and we know that more and more people are not just willing to pay for tiger parts, but are also able to pay for tiger parts. This is Shung Wan District in Hong Kong, notorious for its sales of animal parts. The trade in tiger parts has been illegal in China since 1993, but we asked a Hong Kong journalist to find out whether they are still available. Filming secretly on her mobile phone, she found shocking evidence. Is there a tiger wine on sale? We don't have tiger wine, but we do have tiger penis for sale. If you soak it in rice wine, you can make tiger wine for yourself. You just buy this tiger penis. We have an instruction brochure to teach you how to make it. It's very good for curing back pain and arthritis, and for men to invigorate the kidneys and strengthen yang. It's good for everything. I'm from Beijing. I know tigers are protected animals. You want to buy it, and we're selling it. Don't talk about protected animals. You can have anything you want if you have the money. But I'm afraid it's not real tiger's penis. How can it be fake? Look at this. How can we make a fake penis? Don't worry. In Hong Kong, if you have money, you can buy anything you want. How much is it? We need to weigh it. You want big or small? Each one is about thirty thousand U.S. dollars. How much do you want? Thirty thousand dollars for each. Wow, <laughs> it's a little bit expensive. If you want, I'll give you a discount. Let's see how much this one weighs. This one's thirty-one thousand five hundred dollars. I'll give you twenty-five percent off. So that's twenty-four thousand dollars. The worst thing would be to spend so much time and money and resources actually getting the tigers to the point where they are able to survive back in the wild. Just to see them taken by poachers would be a terrible shame. Mike Baltzer, head of the WWF's tiger program. I don't think anybody in the tiger conservation world would be very happy to see tigers being put back into the wild where we can't guarantee their their safety. But Petrie Fillion says the South China Tiger Project does have plans to protect the animals when they go home. First of all, the areas will be fenced. Secondly, the perimeter fencing will be patrolled on a regular basis. So that in itself will be an effective monitoring process that will have to be in place, and that would certainly also be of huge benefit to monitor any unwanted. Attempts to enter these reserves from maybe people outside or people who have you know, ideas on maybe harming the tigers or removing any of the animals. But Harriet David Mostert says that if South Africa's experience is anything to go by, such measures will not be enough to prevent determined poachers. I think it's going to be a massive problem, as with any wildlife trade, and particularly at this sort of level, 
it really is becoming part of organised crime. So we've got to keep that in mind when we think about where these tigers are, are going to be going back to in China. And this is not sort of local peasants who, you know, trapping for food. If these body parts really can raise the money that I think they can, then these are going to, it's going to be organized syndicates coming in quickly and effectively and, you know, lots of links to corruption and government. And it's a very, very difficult thing to stamp out. If nothing is done to really increase awareness with consumer audiences and uh, help them understand what they're doing when they buy tiger parts, if that is not tackled, that issue, then it will be very challenging to keep these tigers safe. Li believes the publicity the tiger project has generated within China and her efforts to raise awareness there could help to change attitudes towards wildlife in general. The awareness of wildlife has increased already because of the Sartana Tiger Project. You know, we got thousands of articles in Chinese media, 60, 70 different TV programs about the project. We got a lot of fans now in China, and people just hope us to succeed. And that will also gain larger audience for uh, conservation as well. Think of how much they can motivate more than a billion people if they're successful in rewilding and reintroducing these tigers back into the wild in China. David Smith. So the Chinese have to think about how they want to be perceived in the rest of the world. But ultimately, it's a decision that the, the government has to make themselves. The issue of the tiger's return is proving to be politically sensitive in China, despite some high-profile support from people such as wealthy businessman Sir David Tang. Lin Chuan obviously is an extraordinary woman because there are so many things that she could have done, but the point about a passion is that you choose to do one thing and you bring it about when everybody else thinks that you can't do it. And uh, if it wasn't of this retired fashion petite designer, we wouldn't have this rejuvenation, this renaissance of this extraordinary animal. Coming from business background, and one of the things I you know, saw in the first place was that that poor peasant living outside the reserve in Zambia is not going to help if he doesn't have food. He's going to go and approach that um, rhino or hippo. And the same thing in China, in India. So we must find financial solutions to our wildlife issues. Otherwise, it's failed already. Lee and her husband, Stuart Bray, have so far funded the Tiger Project with more than $25 million from their own pockets and some donations from private individuals. We don't receive any grants from any government. We don't receive any grants from any foundations. However, this cannot last if the Tigers go back to China. And that's why we have to explore a sustainable model. I believe that the deeper environmental issues of which the tigers are emblematic are really economic problems, a result of economic activity that's damaging the environment. And unless it's profitable for people to restore and fix the environment, the problem is going to get worse and worse. As a businessman and former banker, Stuart has become increasingly convinced that there needs to be a radical rethink about how conservation is funded. Many conservationists are fundamentally wary of business. They see business as the source of the problem. And if you're working with business, you're in bed with the devil and they're skeptical that this can really be a good idea. In my view, any solution is going to have to involve business if we're going to solve the environmental problems. Stuart's trying to find business models where it's actually profitable to restore and improve the environment. We started out in ecotourism, where the interests of the business and the environment are reasonably closely aligned. But in the Tiger Project, the costs are so great, ecotourism is unlikely to pay for the things that need to be done. So we started looking for bigger business that we could do where the interests were broadly aligned with the environment. So uh, we looked to invest in environmental assets with a view to make a profit to support the uh, Tiger Project. And this includes things like sustainable forestry, uh, wind energy, that sort of thing. And broadly speaking, we look to the debt markets to invest in these assets. And we have to provide a normal commercial return to our lenders with normal commercial requirements for security and collateral and all the assurances they need that they will get their money back and a proper return. 
So we aim to make enough to pay the lenders, and the money that's left over goes to the tigers. It's a challenging idea combining business with conservation, and it's an uphill battle trying to get the long-term investment that will ensure the South China Tiger Project is sustainable once Lee and Stewart's funding runs out. But even so, many tiger conservationists, including Paul Funston of Pretoria University, think the money could be better spent elsewhere. One can't dictate to funders where they should put their money, but one would hope that these sorts of programs are not futile in the long run, and that that huge investment and that that sentiment-driven funding is actually used usefully one day. Reintroduction programs, rewilding programs cost disproportionately more than programs might cost that you're actually working on the ground, conserving space, protecting space, etc. So there's this big dichotomy. People are very passionate, they're very involved, they really believe what they're doing is good. But from a broader sort of perspective, their contributions are often of less value. Yes, some people would say, why bother then to resurrect the tiger? Since you don't have the land and since you don't have the resources without government funding or without、um, other organizations supporting it, then why don't you just let them go extinct? We just can't take this attitude. If we do, we're going to lose everything very, very soon. And by then... We'll be keeping company only with rats and ants and all those animals. David Smith is a big cat scientist who's been won over by Lee's pioneering approach. I had a lot of reservations at first. I've always been a field biologist, and I said to Lee, "I said, Lee, my interest is saving tigers in the wild. Let's save them there before we start with some kind of zoo approach." That attitude has changed because we're now in a desperate situation. We've lost tigers from many, many reserves all over Southeast Asia. Recently, they've estimated the number of tigers in, in 2006, 2008, 2010 2008, to be about one quarter of the number that they had estimated in the previous 30 years. We also know that in many places in India, tigers have gone extinct. And、uh, the recent Global Tiger Initiative in St. Petersburg. There were many people who had been our critics that were beginning to talk about the importance of rewilding and reintroducing tigers. So I think her time is really coming right now. WWF's Mike Bolzer concedes that Lee's efforts are probably the last hope for the survival of the species, even if conditions back home are still not ideal. Well, I wish them all the best with their projects. If it is successful, then it, it is basically the only solution for the South China Tiger. And if a project like this is successful, then we probably have seen the last of the South China Tiger in the wild again. Back at Laohu, the work to save the South China Tiger goes on. Annual air surveys have shown a dramatic increase in numbers and variety of all sorts of animals in the reserve, says Petrie Fillion. We will be using a helicopter to count all the animals in the area, such as、uh, eland, trimspok, as well as as wildebeest. The tigers are, of course, confined to an area of about 200 hectares in total in the game province of area. So the rest of the Lahu Valley Reserve, which is 33,000 hectares, is entirely dedicated to the establishment of indigenous wildlife. Li Chuan argues that the benefits of her conservation efforts will last long after the tigers have gone back to China. If the tigers project finish here, this is gonna stay a reserve. It took a huge amount of investment to restore the defunct sheep farms back to wildlife land, and I personally want to see it remain a wildlife land. Hi, how are you? Good to meet you at last. The helicopter pilot is meeting Lee for the very first time. I have to just say to you that what you've done here—it's incredible. I mean, you know, I, I, things are really difficult with the politics and the problems one faces to、yeah. make something like this happen. But there are so few wilderness areas left in the world, and this is just such a unique place. And you've you've done an incredible thing. I know your initial goal was tigers. Yes. But if you look at the land. You're actually conserving vegetation, plants, birds. You're conserving、Absolutely. stuff that's unique to the Karoo, and the bigger picture is so much greater than just、yes. the tigers. Right now, we have all the、uh, indigenous prey animals, and hopefully,、uh, 
in the future we'll be able to see cheetahs roaming here. Yeah, no, yeah. conservation takes time. So yes. You just got to hang in yeah, there. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it takes a long time. It takes a lot of patience. Have a good survey today and have a good flight. <laughs> okay, bon voyage. Thank you very much. According to Chinese horoscopes for the Year of the Dragon, in 2012, people born in the Year of the Tiger will overcome problems and be in their element. And certainly Li Chuan, despite all the challenges and criticisms she's faced, believes her efforts to save the South China Tiger will now really take off. <laughs>